Hello, it's good to be here. And I'd like to start out by flying something. <laughs> so if you want to learn something like riding a bicycle, you ride a bicycle. If you want to learn science, you've got to do science. Physically do it. I'm an experimental physicist, and that means I like to do things. And here I've rubbed a PVC pipe with a wool sweater, and I've rubbed some shredded nylon ribbon with a wool sweater, and I'm flying them. Now to a physicist, that means that the electrons that are extra on that wand are repelling the electrons that are extra in that piece of nylon and repelling it against the pull of all the atoms in the earth. That activity is so good that high school students that have already been admitted to college will play around with it for extra time in the classroom <laughs> because it's really interesting to fly something. Okay, uh, not even Hogwarts. So these ideas come to you from the Exploratorium, and we just moved. We have a new home, Pier 15, on the Embarcadero in San Francisco. And the Teacher Institute there, as Jonathan told you, works with high school and middle school science and math teachers. We have some things that we've observed about learning in the last 40 years, and one of them is, one of the most powerful motivating factors for learning about science is actually experiencing the phenomena. And here I have some teachers that are actually experiencing the colors that come when you stretch a thin layer of soap film, transparent, clear, colorless soap film, and it obtains these colors when you stretch it. And the colors move and dance, and you can stick your fingers through it if they're wet. <laughs> um, another thing about science, beyond starting with the experience and the observations, is that you have to be honest about what you know and what you don't know. You might not know that, but uh, you have to be honest. So I went into the Exploratorium machine shop where they were building this great exhibit, and the machinists there were just scratching their heads and looking puzzled, and I walked over and, and asked them, what are you doing? And they said, well, we're trying to build this exhibit, but we can't make it work. And acknowledging the fact that they didn't know how to make it work was the first step to making it work. So I worked through them what they wanted to do and actually showed them that mathematics can be useful <laughs> to calculate the length of these strings. So we made this exhibit, and a visitor came in and saw the exhibit out on the floor where we test them for a year before we actually christened them as done. Once it's built, um, I come up with how to build this at home for under $10 for teachers. So this is the teacher version. And then I tell them, you take this home, and now you use it to inspire your students and make them build it. Because you have cut and measured and built things your entire life, hundreds of times. And those kids might not have built anything ever, so make them do the work. But here, here's our teacher measuring and making it work. Well, um, oh yeah, the, another thing here is uh, repeat important ideas. I'll come back to this. This is Mara Hill, and she is using two syringes with a hose between them, a small syringe and a big syringe. And the small one, when you squeeze it, will always win against the big one because it's the pressure in the tube that's important here. It's constant. And the force depends on that constant pressure and the diameter of the syringe. This is a way to really appreciate the difference between force and pressure. You put one syringe in each hand and you feel it yourself. Um, another important topic is once you discover something, publish it. And you can publish it in the old way by writing books, which we do in the Teacher Institute. We really believe in set, giving our ideas away for free. But the Exploratorium started on the web. We were the first science museum on the web in 1993. We're website number 600 out of all the websites on Earth. We have 20 years we've been putting up web pages. We now have 40,000 free web pages on things you can build and trying to help you with, with education. And in our 2013 web page, we're actually brave. On the bottom of that page, if any of you post anything that has the hashtag Exploratorium, we'll put it up on our site. Now eventually it'll get looked at, and if it's illegal or immoral or something, we'll take it off. But if you like us or if you don't like us, we're gonna put it up there. So our, our page is live, and we believe in your feedback. Um, learning science is hard work. For your students to learn science, they have to do a lot of work, and the learning is theirs to do. <laughs> teachers are there to help them over the humps. But the first thing that teachers do is to make science interesting. And here I have some teachers, there are two motors there spinning a string and it makes these wonderful patterns, especially if you use a strobe to look at it. 
And they're entranced by this, and this is a great project for seventh graders to build. Two motors, if, you, if they rotate the same direction, this exhibit works great. If they rotate in opposite directions, the string winds up and pulls the motors off the mounts. That's a good thing for a seventh grader to learn. There are two ways to hook this up, and one of them works. Um, you should also help out the learning by making it relevant. Uh, here we are making actual models of carbon dioxide and water vapor, two greenhouse gases. This is Lori Lambertson. She's really passionate about teaching about global warming. And she, if you take these models, and you, they're made with um, hacksaw blades and, and binder clips and, and as weights, and if you wiggle them up and down, the actual bonds represented by the hacksaw blades vibrate in the same way that the molecule vibrates when it's absorbing infrared radiation. And both water and CO2 are infrared absorbers. And so by building this physically and feeling it, maybe when you get to chemistry, you can remember these oscillations that are driven by the infrared radiation. And then think about that for this clear gas that's going to change the temperature of the Earth's atmosphere and maybe inspire some hard work to do something about it. Um, Making science fun is good not only for the students, it's good for the teacher. We have long days <laughs> of teaching, and a little laughter now and then is a great thing to keep you going. So we've discovered that if you have a student, and my students are actually teachers, crawl into a large plastic bag, <laughs> not with their head, <laughs> and uh, then stick a hose from a vacuum cleaner in the bag, and uh, turn on the vacuum, um, you suck the air out of the bag, reducing the pressure in the bag, and it sucks the bag in around them. So it is the, the best form-fitting clothing you could ever believe. It, may, it lets you know what it feels like to be a vacuum-packed sausage. And, uh, but then, another important thing in science is measurement. So I'm a mountaineer, and I have a watch that reads pressure. So I climbed into one of these bags that was transparent and put the vacuum hose in there. And I found out that vacuums are really terrible producers of vacuum. Um, the atmospheric pressure out here in the air is like 14.7 pounds per square inch. A vacuum cleaner reduces that by one or two pounds per square inch, like 10% less. And yet, that one pound difference on every square inch of this plastic bag will squeeze you in tightly. Once you've sat in this plastic bag and just experience the pressure of one-tenth of an atmosphere squeezing in on your whole body, you'll remember atmospheric pressure forever. And you'll have a good laugh, too. Um, my friend Modesto uh, is a great teacher. He's taught everything from kindergarten through college. And I learn a lot by watching other good teachers. And he has a couple rules that I'm going to share with you. One is start class with a provocazione. Uh, provocation. And another thing is, when you're a good teacher, what you do is jazz. And I'll show you what that means in a moment. He has another rule, which is, poorly written instructions lead to great creativity among your audience. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't share that one. Absolutely true. So the provocazione uh, is one where you do something and everybody knows what's going to happen. So I took a $20 bill and dipped it in alcohol, 90% isopropanol, held it up and set it on fire. And you know, this flaming $20 bill is bye-bye, is it's gone. But of course, it's not gone. That, that alcohol evaporates and burns, especially when it's warm, and the, the heat rises from the bill without setting it on fire. Now, that's not something I'd do for a classroom of kids, but it is something I do with a classroom of teachers. Um, with kids, I'd use a, a, one of the new neodymium magnets and uh, you can attract a $20 bill with a neodymium magnet. It has magnetic ink on it, which is one of the ways that the banks read it. When you stick the $20 bill in that, uh, that machine that's counting your money, they look at the magnetic pattern on it, and it tells them whether it's a 20 or a 50 or a 10. And so you can attract the bill with a neodymium magnet. And by the way, as teachers, you change the world. One of my students was on the team at General Motors that invented neodymium magnets. And today, almost all electric cars have 10 or more kilograms of neodymium magnets in them. It's what, how they convert the stored electrical energy into motive power efficiently. So you teach kids, they go out there, 
they can change the world. It's amazing. Um, what we do is jazz. A jazz musician has to be a great instrumentalist and within the structure of jazz, implement, uh, uh, um, plays around with the audience and comes up with a whole new performance each time. You as teachers know your stuff and you know your students. So I was going down the Zambezi River to teach the villagers how not to go blind during a total solar eclipse. And I had my lesson plan all ready and I walked into this village and they welcomed me with song and dance. So I threw out my lesson plan and I taught it in dance. So here I have two, two girls, one of them's the earth, one of them's the moon and I'm having them do the dance of the sun and the moon. That's the jazz of teaching. You find out who your audience is and you go with it. You listen, you take their questions. Um, here's another bit of jazz. Uh, this item that she's holding up in the old days, cameras used to use film. And they came in these extraordinarily useful things <laughs> called film cans. Oh, I miss them so. And what she's doing is she's looking through a hole in the film can. And that's a, a nice pinhole viewer. You can do lots of experiments with that. One day in one of my classes, one of the students looked up and said, the hole is changing size in my film can. And I thought, what? <laughs> that can't be true. But I, I said, actually, so show me, what's, how, do, how do you do this? And he said, well, I looked through the, pin, the pinhole in the film can and, with my right eye, and when I open my left eye, the hole gets smaller. And when I close my left eye, the hole gets bigger. Well, I tried it, and he was right. <laughs> That's very strange. We did a lot of experiments. I, I dumped the main idea of the class and we immediately turned all the teachers in the room loose on trying to figure out what happened. And what goes on is, I didn't know this, the pupil size in your right eye is controlled somewhat by the light that goes into your left eye. They're, they're cross-coupled through the optic nerve. And in fact, that's why sports coaches, when a kid has a head injury, shines a light into the left eye and watches what happens to the right eye. It's a quick probe of the brain. Signal goes down the optic nerve and comes back. It's a quick loop. If, if the eyes don't respond, that kid has real trouble. Um, so that was an interesting thing. And now, at your place, there is a string. So when it came time, the Dalai Lama recently decided that uh, science might be something interesting for Buddhists in exile to learn. So he asked the Teacher Institute to come and teach the monk teachers uh, about science. And I wanted to start them with something on the importance of perception in science. So what I had them do was take a string and put it, you have your string, put it under your nose, hold it out in front of you and look at it. And I ask, what do you see? So when you look, what do you see? Two strings. Wait a minute, what do you feel? One string, a provocazione. What is, how can you see two and which string, what's going on here? And what's the shape? It's an X or a V or parallel lines. Look close, it becomes an X. Look far, it becomes a V. I'm giving you the answer, but normally I'd have the class struggle through this. And it depends on how you're looking. Close your right eye while you're looking. Which string vanishes? The left one. What? It's all crooked, it's all backwards. So I leave you with this as a, as a research topic. So one of the keys to teaching is the keys to storytelling. And that stories have three parts and the last one has a twist. A scientist, the scientist looks at something that everyone has looked at and sees something no one else has seen. A teacher helps students see things that they've looked at and never seen before. And what's the twist? A student asks teachers questions. <laughs> that inspire the teachers to see things they've never seen before. The students are a part of our learning as well, and that's some of the most fun we have as teachers. When you're telling stories, by, oh, the other thing is that uh, uh, facilitated exploration provides simple materials for people to work with. That whole screen I showed you of the soap film in the Exploratorium, four feet wide and four feet high, you can do it with a film can, Dawn liquid detergent, a soapy mixture in water, dip the film can in, put it on a white sheet of paper, and you see the pattern of colors here. Hook was a foe of Newton. Hook said, it's interesting, there's no color at the top of this film, this film, he made this, he didn't have film cans, but he made it. 
And he said, there must be a new force of nature stretching that film tight. Isaac Newton took a pin and pushed it in to that force and burst it, showing that there was actually a film there that was invisible. Newton hated Hooke. He really loved to stick that pin in him. That's the story of humanity in science. Once you see those patterns, you can, or inhumanity to man, once you see those patterns, you'll see them in the street. Spilled gasoline has that same pattern. You can model it in the classroom by drawing waves. The right wave there is a red wave. It's longer wavelength than the left one that's blue. You can lay down on the floor and have teachers explore how these waves move through. The, the, the masking tape on the floor here represents the thickness of that soap film. And by socially discussing this, those teachers learn things by listening to each other that they never thought to ask themselves. And you can also create these things permanently. This is one I like to do is clear nail polish, put on water, float it on, nail, on water, bring a black sheet of paper up and you make that pattern permanently as a piece of art. Um, one way to do this, to make great experiments is to take things you normally do like a string telephone and make it multiple. Here's Eric Muller humming into a spoon that's tied to strings that lead to a bunch of teachers. And they're all smiling because what he's doing is really strange and really funny, but it will teach you that sound travels through string. You've probably all done the experiment where you have two magnets on a, a pencil and they float above each other. Put five on there and look at that. It's the Earth's atmosphere. This is why the atmosphere is dense at the bottom and thin on top. The top two magnets, the, the, the bottom of the two top ones only has to hold up one magnet. The bottom magnet here and the one above it has to hold up four of them. That's what's happening in the atmosphere. It's a wonderful model to help kids learn about why the atmosphere is thin above and dense below. Um, you can make things big. A straw oboe, if you add a bell to it, gets louder. <laughs> add a big bell. The, the um, pendulum snake, you can make it big enough that people can ride it. <laughs> so don't miss that. You can make things graphically wonderful. You can, you can take images to illustrate your work and make them beautiful. Um, you can make measurements in the classroom. Measurements are important, but when you're making the measurements, don't forget to have fun. These teachers turned the measurement of waves into a jump rope activity. Fun can be had in the museum. <laughs> the sign is correct. There are bathrooms both ways. Food is important. We always start our workshops with food and making sure people are fed. And you gotta have heart. Show the passion for your work and share it with others. So go out there and be passionate about teaching. <laughs>